Ralph here once again, and tonight we're going to add an additional dimension to our data analysis. We are going to pull information from the Household Pulse Survey produced by the census.gov. And what this is going to reveal to us is generally the economic hardship or challenges that families have been presented with during this pandemic, state of emergency, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, on the individual on the household, as well as basically any impact it may have on their educational attainment or delays in educational attainment. But first, as promised, we are gonna start with the COVID-19 research that is pertinent to the individual that came out over the past seven days. So let us begin. First one, I know it's redundant. We've seen it uh, presented month after month after month. The correlation between COVID-19 infection rates, fatalities or mortality rates, so on and so forth. But however, though, it is confirmed again. 80% of COVID-19 patients have vitamin D deficiencies. Now, those that follow the channel recognize that we first covered this back in April when epidemiologists discovered that those individuals that were succumbing to COVID-19 were severely deficient in vitamin D. They had ricket level vitamin D in their system, so to say, very, very low. And therefore they were succumbing very rapidly or they were a perfect breeding ground, I should say, for SARS-CoV-2. And those individuals that were deficient in vitamin D the most were of course in the nursing homes. And so fast forward to today, in Spain, the same correlation, yet policymakers have failed to act on probably one of the most important aspects. The easiest way to mitigate the pandemic would have been recommending vitamin D. But instead, we are converting back to or reverting back to old medieval strategies, face masks, lockdown, distancing. Yet, if vitamin D is as powerful as it is in reference to these research articles, it easily eclipses all those three draconian pandemic measures, hands down. But let us proceed to the next research as follows. Some interesting things referenced this week that came out. There are death rates among people with severe COVID-19 dropped by a half in England. Now, obviously there's been some antigenic drift in reference to the virus. I'm gambling on something called antigenic shift occurring because I'm noticing that people can be co-infected with influenza and COVID-19 because we're doing weird things in the way we're mitigating this virus. But I digress. But to proceed forward, what is a little deceptive about this headline is this. So let's look at it a little closer. All right, here we are. They found the death rates were highest in late March at 26% among people admitted to high dependency units. All right, we'll go to the next last line. For June emissions, death rates had dropped to 7% among high dependency units. So depending on what information you want to look at here or here to here, you can say you had close to about a three to four fold drop in those overall death unit, I mean death rates. But however though, they chose, I guess the air on the side of caution. Next research article. All right, now keep in mind, I am no fan of aspirin. I think aspirin is overused for too many maladies. However though, Life is life and bias is bias. And you have to sometimes put your emotional bias aside to look at the actual data. And the actual data looks pretty darn promising. Watch this, just check this out. Hospitalized patients who are taking daily aspirin at lower risk of ICU admission, ventilation, and dying from the virus. So much so, it caught my attention. So if we scroll down a little bit here, they found, the researchers found that aspirin was associated with a 44% reduction in the risk of being put on a mechanical ventilator, a 43% decrease in the risk of ICU admission, and most importantly, a 47% decrease in the risk of dying in the hospital compared to those not taking aspirin. That, out of all the typical things out of pharmacopoeia, I'm not talking herbs, vitamins, or supplements, I'm talking vitamin D, I'm talking the general run-of-the-mill pharmacopoeia. 
that beats just about all of them. And something so simple and incredibly cheap. Now, I know a lot of you people in, out there, which are researchers reference the Spanish flu, for those not familiar with the Spanish flu, a lot of the deaths that occurred because of the Spanish flu was not because of the flu itself, was because of the overabundance of the recommendation of aspirin. Now, back at that time, they were recommending between eight to 30 grams of aspirin because of something new. They weren't really monitoring the side effects and many, 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 many people died of obviously of aspirin overdose. So that brings back some bad memories. However, through responsible use of low dose aspirin, that's pretty amazing figures overall. But let us proceed. So I have to put our emotional bias aside just a little bit. To the next one, talk about emotional bias. The reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of researchers are really, there is so much tribal mentality in reference to pandemic mitigation and so much at stake for political leaders who have invested so much in lockdowns and very draconian pandemic measures that they feel if they say, whoops, I made an error, uh, there could be issues. And this has all become political. And of course, in the next few days, in the United States here, our politics are gonna change forever. So one way or the other. So basically whatever happens here is a reflection of what happens here in science. Science has become politicized so much so that a lot of researchers that I know get as far as death threats themselves. And a lot of research I've seen, for example, that question the efficacy of masks from 2015 beyond, they've actually asked the researchers to either pull the research or rewrite it. Have some good examples of that should you need. All right, now let's proceed with the research as follows, going to the data analytics. Here we go. All right, of course, I'm going to read this for the first time with you as well. So we're going to run the kernel. The first kernel we are doing is on the household pulse survey. All right, and the kernel is running. Boom, ba -da boom. All right, it hasn't updated to do, uh, the 1st of November yet, so we're looking at October 31st. All right, here we are. First one, expected loss in employment income. Hawaii, pretty close to 40%. Now, I did something a little different here too, as well. What I did here is also run the data table. So about 40% of Hawaiians are gonna expect to lose their income or know someone that's gonna lose their income in the next four weeks as of October 31st, 2020. And our current, I wanna let you decide whether, if you're a policymaker, whether the lockdown is worth the loss. So here we have, as of October 31st, we had 100 people test positive increase, and we had about seven people additional in the hospital for a total of 59 in the hospital total. And that's complete as of today, or I should say as, as of October 31st. And they had one additional death. Now, you're a policymaker. You have to make the decision. Is that uh, worth, per se, because every, every life is valuable, but is that lockdown worth as much as that many people losing their employment income? To proceed forward. Food scarcity. All right, this is Mississippi. So people that may not have enough to eat, and remember this is all due to the coronavirus. Uh, let's not, I shouldn't say all due, let's say it could be confounding factors. And I'll show you the household pulse survey in a little bit. They started keeping track of the data in response to the coronavirus to see how bad it would affect families. Mississippi, households, households, where there was sometimes often not enough to eat in the last seven days. Mississippi, Arkansas, going down the line. I'm only looking at the top states. All right, and that's about 17.5%, 18%. And to give you an idea, Mississippi, we had an 824 increase. We had no additional individuals in the hospital. The hosp people in the hospital has actually dropped. And they had additional six deaths in close to 2,976,000 people. And what I'm doing here is, I'm, just for those that want to know, is I'm merging data tables and they are formatted in the population of data tables so I have a fair comparison. 
and also the data table in reference to the hardships uh, from the census.gov. All right, to proceed forward, once again, we're looking at Mississippi housing and security. Percentage of adults who are not current on the rent or mortgage payments who have slight to no confidence that their household can pay next month's rent or mortgage. Looking at about 14% in Mississippi, and Mississippi is just getting hammered. And so if you're a policy leader for Mississippi, you really have to look at you know, the future damage that you may cause. People do die of starvation. They do die of exposure, loneliness. So you have to weigh out the entire balance of whether your pandemic lockdown may be worse than basically COVID itself not being mitigated, but to proceed as follows. So you have Mississippi. All right, again, we look at the data once again, same thing. Now, likelihood of eviction or foreclosure. This is intriguing. Now, I had to double check the data on this, and I'll show you in a second. Montana. Remember, this is tracking the COVID data. Mississippi, again, is getting hammered. But Montana, this is weird because you look at the whole, all the data as a whole, you wouldn't expect Montana of all places. Close to 60% of the people not current on rent or mortgage where, where evic eviction or foreclosure next two months is either very likely or somewhat likely. And here's your data. All right, now again, you're a policymaker, you decide. 885 increase. All right, we're looking at 23 people additional in the hospital for a total of 369 people in the hospital. Uh, there was 11 deaths related to COVID. And you have a population, you know, about, you know, right in the right, that range right there. So 1,068,778. You have to decide. I'm not going to try to bias it any further than that. But again, that's like, you look at over half the state has a hard time making rent or mortgage. That is a really, really very pandemic sensitive state as well as Mississippi to proceed as follows. Oh, no, by, by the way, let's, pers let's move a little bit more to that data. And just to show you, here's Montana right there to validate the data. There it is. Now, I wanna show you an important aspect here. And this is from one of the other aspects as far as the research for poverty. The people which are being hit the most hard by COVID, could you imagine minorities in that aspect, 48% have a hard time making their household expenses. Now, this is what I call a, like a, a pandemic where the people impacted the least had the most amount of money. So they're not really sensitive in their sphere of friends to basically how incredibly corrosive the lockdowns are having on so many individuals. In fact, the number one way or route to rebellion has been shown to be economic uh, disparity or economic gaps between the rich and the poor. And this pandemic, more than anybody else, has affected low-wage workers the most. And the low-wage workers tend to have the least voice in this whole, whole play. But to go back to the data as follows. All right, so we're looking at basically like a good eviction of foreclosure. All right, next Difficulty paying the household expenses. Mississippi is, you, that you, again, if you're the governor of Mississippi, you decide. Louisiana being hit really hard. Once again, we looked at the data over and over again. Secondary education. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is where all your future inventors, leaders, scientists, so on and so forth, are basically coming forward uh, in secondary education. Now, who gets hit the hardest? Rhode Island. Look at this. Percentage of adults in households where at least one adult was planning on taking post-secondary classes this fall, but for whom those plans have either been canceled or changed in some significant way. Look at that. It's amazing. These are your future inventors, scientists, obviously those would be one of the same, leaders, doctors, health care providers, all, all delayed because of a pandemic lockdown in which a lot of the research has stated before has gone back to here that well, what could have happened instead is they want an alternative approach that shields those most at risk while enabling the rest of the population to resume their ordinary lives to some extent but instead we went tribal and said no we slammed our feet and 
and slam their hands and slam doors and lock down, and in this case, lock out. All right, especially if you're gonna use language that's similar to prison terminology, then yeah, you deserve what you get. But look at this, here we are. Positive increase, now that's gotta be a data irregular, uh, a reporting irregularity because again, we're, you know, it's October, it's November 1st, so it's October 31st, so yeah, that can happen. Uh, hospitalized currently stayed, and again, they, they probably had a death, it was probably not reported as of yet because that'd be outside what I would consider a standard deviation of one or two. And so, but just the same, you're the governor of Rhode Island or New Mexico or Washington, what would you do? Especially knowing that one of these individuals could eventually be a future doctor, or actually many of them, healthcare providers, which five or 10 years down the road, you're responsible for saving many a life. All right, now let's go right into the data that we've run before. So let's go to do, do, do Scandinavia because we know our famous doctor out there, which said we can't be compared to Scandinavia because we're Scandinavians. So let's begin, start kernel, run all cells. Of course, we're talking Sweden, which Sweden said, hey, we're not gonna bow to international pressure. We're gonna do our own thing and pay the consequences or basically reap the benefits of those brave decisions to proceed as follows. Does that sound biased or what, brave decision? There it goes. So we're looking at it right now, and this is cases per million, total deaths per million, Sweden, USA. Again, you look at this data, it is very deceptive. You look at here, here, but again, Sweden decided once again to repeat, to bear the brunt of it early and then ride it out. Like a pilot flying through turbulence, instead of landing the plane every time they hit turbulence, the Swedes said, hey, let's just make it to our destination to proceed. All right, so here we are, Sweden. Right down there, we're looking at new deaths smooth per million. United States, you're still up there. I want to include Great Britain in a second, hang on. Iceland, Norway, Finland, um, yeah, they're all down here. They all, they all experience the same wave, but guess what they're not having? They're not having the second wave. Pay attention to that observation, at least as far as now. Let's look at the data a little closer, all right? We're looking here at the new cases smooth per million. Yeah, of course they're going up. But again, you're looking at deaths, not cases. Because again, after a while, if the mortality rate of COVID drops to something less than the influenza, you may be starting to see figures as such. New cases smooth per million. Uh, Iceland, real important, focus on Iceland. Don't look at their death rate. Again, they may lose a person or two, which is which is serious, especially to the families of those that took the loss. But however though, uh, totally different outcomes as far as mortality rates overall. All right, here we are. We are looking now at new deaths from the familia. All right, Iceland, they had their one, twice, or two people. Denmark, right about there. Sweden, actually now below Iceland. Uh, USA, of course, we sometimes lose sight but it's all the way up here. Here we are as far as cases smooth per million, deaths smooth per million, as far as comparison on a basically a bar chart. And then this is basically since uh, recently after September 1st, when we noticed there was a, actually we did notice there was a pretty strong shift in the virus mutagenic wise, as I said before, antigenic drift uh, to a more transmissible form, but far less lethal. And, but however, though, the pandemic mitigation strategies have not been updated since that discovery, surprisingly, for many countries. A lot of countries did alter their, um, their strategies, except for, of course, a few Western countries. And here we go. And then let's go back to Sweden real fast. I thought I had it here. Uh, no, I must not. So let's go back. And then here's Iceland because they just made the chart once again. I wanna see why they went up. Yeah, Iceland unfortunately uh, looks like they've had a death or two uh, over a while of having no deaths within a short period of time. Uh, the, basically the past week or so that looked like at zero. All right, let's go to the next one. We go to data focus. Let's make a run on it. Now keep in mind a lot of information to come up with Kendall Tao stuff and everything else like that. That's for me, that's data analysis looking for correlations. 
which I've really not seen any correlation except from a nutritional aspect, but it's not going to show here. All right, let's begin. That's your uh, basically pair of plots, data stuff, data, 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 data. This, again, this is to show if our treatments are improving. This is United States data. Positive increase, hospitalization increase. All right, that is from March to, again, this is November 1st. To proceed again, still, um, noticing that dance between hospitalization increase and death increase, which is showing me that treatments really have not been improving that much once an individual is in the hospital. All right, a positive increase as far as testing, the hospitalization increase at this time. What do you see? You tell me. There's your numbers. Hospitalization cases and death per case. Look at those lines almost from parallel. Yeah, you have a little anomaly here and there, but still for the most part, that's from October to the end of this month so far. Pretty similar. Again, same parallel numbers, same parallel numbers, da da da. All right, the next one. Now look at our states. And do we make a run? Do, do, do. Please forgive me if I'm slurring my words a little bit. I have a real busy day today, so I'm really kind of tired, but I promise to get this out. All right, so let's begin. We ran our curve. All right, here we are. We are basically looking at our states, Florida, New York, California, Georgia, and South Dakota. And our populations uh, manually put in this aspect. And here we are. In South Dakota, we are looking at a death increase per 100,000. Now, keep in mind, when you look at per 100,000, you're comparing apples to apples. So South Dakota looks far worse, but overall, if you have one person succumb, unfortunately, to COVID-19, it affects all the charts because the population density is very low. We have one person that may succumb in California to COVID-19, you're not gonna have really much of a bump at all as such. Now, look what we're looking at here. Florida, look at that right there. Now the reason I chose these dates is because this is when Florida decided to go off the lockdowns and the governor said, I promise never to do this again. And the media basically said it's going to start raining cats and dogs, apocalypse is going to occur, uh, what's going to happen. They did the same thing in Georgia back in April when they said Georgia was some sort of massive human experiment. Well, those are your results. That's what that is for. Uh, and then South Dakota, we are positive increases. Yes, that we are seeing. Again, it is per 100,000, but however though, uh, total deaths is where it's gonna come down to. And then of course, here's Florida and Georgia, which basically really look uneventful, look the same as New York and California, which have massive lockdowns. And then to proceed, all right, that's just total deaths, so it's not really a fair comparison. Let's go down, down, down. Again, not a fair comparison. Here we are. Positive increase per 100,000. Uh, this is gonna real, This is from the time that Florida itself decided to uh, stop the lockdowns. Uh, we we'll probably have to look at the mean there. Yeah. So Florida, actually, yeah, it's still, the median from the beginning is still a little higher or the mean. So the graph can be deceptive because you have all these ups and downs. So Florida doesn't have the lockdown per se. They have a, still a little higher positive increase, even though it looks like it's racing towards the bottom, but it's got some wild numbers up and down. That's why you want, when you have this massive variation, that's when you want to use mean and median. All right, to proceed as follows. This is death increase per 100,000. It looked pretty high, but look what you see happening. You see the normalization as time is forward. And then we proceed. All this experimental stuff. I think there may be one chart I want to show you. Experimental, positive increases, experimental. All right, here we are. Uh, da, da, da. Is it all the way down here? Yeah, this is what I want to look at. This is your deaths, unfortunately, accumulated per state. And there we are, South Dakota, as we looked before. In those graphs, how they can be deceptive because the population density is very low. So if an individual unfortunately does succumb, 
makes the graphs look really, really intimidating. However, though, when you look at this as a whole, it changes your perspective. And of course, Texas, California, and Florida, on uh, New Jersey, Illinois, still some of your highest uh, as far as unfortunate mortality. And so, and this is basically deaths recently. Montana's popping up there for whatever reason, I don't know. Texas is still pretty high, but it's got a high population. So see what we here? Montana, which has a lower population, and you have Texas, which has a higher population, it can be deceptive, even though Texas is probably doing far better than Montana. But however though, again, looking at the hardship overall, where we're looking at do, 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 Montana itself, we're looking at 11 on the increase scale, that's probably 27. So 27 deaths they had at that one day. They probably didn't register yet on that particular graph. But to proceed as follows to the next one. So that was the states. Let us now go to the Scandinavian. We're gonna look at the world, here we go. All right, let's make a run through. And we're looking at this data for the first time together. And we're going to run through and see how the world is doing. Look at this. See, look at your new cases being smooth. And again, a lot of our pandemic lockdown strategy is happening right around this time. But look at this. Look at your new cases going up. Look at your new deaths, smooth per million. That is a pretty flat line. Proceed. This is what this is here, for those that asked prior. This is your cases to deaths ratio, mortality ratio. What do you see there? It's continuing to drop. It can drop pretty significantly. In fact, it's actually probably below when it was first discovered there. Again, April, May, that's when everyone gave up their civil liberties, said, hey, protect us, do what we need to do. But however, though, now is a little different story. And we're entering flu season on top of that, which is kind of interesting. Keep on going. All right. This is new cases, smooth per million to new deaths. Looked at, looked at, repeated. All right, here we are. This is, the, again, this is the world. Here is Great Britain. When did Great Britain start talking about its lockdowns? Now, think about that psychologically. Look how outside of all, if you were doing statistics, you had to look at the, you know, standard deviation of one or two. This is bizarre. Look at this. Skyrockets. But in the USA, skyrocket. Now Sweden, their cases have gone up as well. But however though, asymptomatic or cases which are being detected, but symptoms aren't really showing, you gotta really ask yourself a question. You know, is that really something worth recording or not? Especially if it creates an undue fear. All right, and of course, here we have our Asian friends, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. What do you see there? It's almost along the x-axis itself. New deaths per million? They mean, they're not gonna be breaking down any doors to get a vaccine. New deaths per million, here we go. Great Britain, lockdown. When did that happen? So looking at October 25th, Actually, over October 23rd, they actually surpassed the United States in new deaths per million. USA, you see right there. And of course, now here, Sweden. Now look at this, now keep this in mind. This is interesting because, I don't know if you're talking herd immunity, because uh, obviously if the cases are going up, herd immunity hasn't kicked in. But some resistance or immunity to the virus must have taken hold, especially as well in these Asian countries, no doubt about it, they're all on the x-axis. X-axis. Again, I apologize once again, it's late. But there you are, new deaths per million. And remember what we saw here? What do you see that's not correlating? What's not correlating is infection rates to mortality rates. Except in, we're looking at Great Britain and the United States. Why is that? Again, that's up to you to speculate. Proceed forward, and here is Sweden's death rate per million. All right, now we're looking at Sweden, the United States, and I'm doing this because of, you know, Dr. Fauci. 
because he just blew off all Sweden's uh, mitigation strategy because it wasn't what they were doing. And science is about, when you look at countries, you have to ha have a control. You have to say, are we doing what we're doing? Is it working? Let's look at countries with the different things and see if that's making a difference or not. We totally are not paying attention to any controls. Oh, we'll analyze ourselves. It's like, you know, from basically like a fishbowl mentality. We'll look to see what works inside our borders. But we're not looking to see what works outside our borders. That's the problem. And that's where bias is kicking in. So a new death smooth per million, Sweden, new death smooth per million, USA. Uh, this is, again, new deaths. So overall, and Sweden looks like they had one death, one death, bad day on the 27th. No deaths on the 30th. Compare it to the United States at 968. We'll proceed, keep on forward, going forward. Uh, cases per million, da, da, da. This is Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan. What did we discuss last week? What's a major difference beyond the masks? Since COVID uh, or SARS or COV2 seems to be transmitted very easily through droplets, where do those droplets drop? The floor. And again, what is one cultural variation that's different than the United States and Great Britain often? They take their shoes off. And since shoes are a major transmission vector, that can play a role too. It would be hard pressed not to show it playing a role. Remember, they were showing a 100% positivity rate on the floor where nobody with COVID was entering. But people that didn't have COVID were tracking it in on the soles of the shoes. So imagine walking around the carpet of your house, upstairs, bathrooms, so on and so forth. And who knows how long SARS-CoV-2 lasts and carpet fibers and things along those lines. Yeah, you get the picture. All right, total deaths per million between the states, da-da-da-da-da. All right, and this was due to tuberculosis and starvation, but let's move on to the next one. Uh, we are going to go to the Monte Carlo scenario. And here we are. I'm always interested as far as how this works, as far as... Um, Almost started running itself or selling. I apologize. Here we go. We're starting the kernel, running the entire kernel. Do, do, do. Remember what a Monte Carlo scenario is. What we are doing is we're using basically a, a program that's normally used in order to determine financial data, uh, changes up and down in reference to COVID itself. And we're running a thousand iterations. And here we are, new deaths current in the United States. All right, that's just accumulation once again so it's always going to go up of case after case all we're trying to do is determine where those cases are going to be Monte Carlo shows it cases will go up but the question is the death rates cases per million it's pretty much very very narrow slope in the middle if you look at the mean and then new deaths per million which we're really focused on because cases don't seem to be as pertinent if the transmissibility has been increased, but the mortality has been decreased. Otherwise, you're kind of like tracking the common cold. It's like, why bother? But we're seeing, and we're still looking. Monte Carlo has been wrong so far. And again, we're projecting up to January 20th. Still going to be showing a decline in the overall death rate, or should say cases per million. Uh, right along that particular slope. We're trying to find the middle, the middle there. Again, that gives you a little bit of information. Uh, as far as the research information we looked at, we looked at basically this, scientific intimidation, which is very common. Aspirin, again, I have a bias against aspirin, so an emotional bias, not a scientific bias. And that's pretty astounding figures. And then, death rates. Again, we talked about transmissibility and mortality rates beginning to decline, but transmissibility increasing, making the lockdowns very questionable, all right? Then we looked at basically vitamin D and its correlation being confirmed over and over and over again, but very, to this day, none of our political leaders, or they could call themselves thought leaders, have made any inroads in saying, hey, you know what, people? Let's get some sun, let's increase our vitamin D levels, let's build a nutritional firewall against this pandemic, uh, this particular pandemic and future pandemics to come. 
Remember, those that studied um, you know, disease history may recognize that the Black Death, whatever it may have been at that time, seemed to progress rapidly in those areas which were suffering from malnutrition or nutritional deficiencies. Keep in mind, all because you are rich and have money does not mean you don't suffer from malnutrition through poor dietary choices. Again, we're off to our channel signing off once again. I look forward to talking to you all in the next seven days. It will be very, very interesting between this week and next week due to the political uh, climate in the United States itself. But as always, gratitude, thank you. Links will be there to follow you to the original, to go to the original articles. Again, I worked pretty hard today. A lot of moving stuff around. So please forgive me slower my words. I'll talk to you all next time. See you then. Gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.